The check-in show is on now. Legend, of course, today I'm on the check-in with Janice from Family Groove Company, uh, aka What Would Janice Do? <laughs> and I, 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 all week I was like, I'm not even going to say that. I'm not even going to bring it up. You, ha you have to. <laughs> We're going to talk about Built to Last coming up on Sunday and all of the excitement around that and some of the players that are coming in. Obviously, you're the crown jewel. Oh, However, <laughs> right, there's other people on the gig uh, that they've built around you, and that show's going to be amazing. So we'll talk a little bit more specifically about that at the Hook and Ladder, 3 o'clock, August 1st, 2021. We're in this weird 2021 space. We get to hang out with Janice tonight on the check-in. So yay. Yay. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. I don't want to get much deeper into you before I head on over to my interview area. Uh, over, way over here. I'll meet you over there in one second. Because you're the show, you know? Yeah. I'm just cool. a guy, guy with cool stuff <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I have a whole bunch of topics that I'd like to get in with you and spend a little bit of time here. Um, but maybe we can talk a little bit more just in kind of general about what it's like being a bass player in Chicago right now in summer 2021. Uh, it's actually, it feels really good right now. You know, I just started playing again, you know, post pandemic, uh, maybe the end of May. And all my projects are starting to pick up a little bit. Um, and so I'm back out there playing and it's like, uh, it just feels amazing to be doing what I love again after so long of just sitting at home and like playing in front of my computer, like along with YouTube, you know, <laughs> to be playing with real people and have, you know, the fans coming out and like re-appreciating live music again. It's, it's great. Wow, you mentioned the fans, and as a lover of music and someone who's dabbled a bit myself, it's amazing to see how validated the fan is now when it comes to the whole sort of circle of life of being a musician. Right. You know, like without that element, it kind of pulls the rug out from under the whole deal. Yeah, definitely. And then you're in your apartment right. in front of a screen. Teacher, do you, do you teach at all? Uh, I do teach, though I, I didn't do many, much virtual lessons. Um, I don't know, I really prefer in-person. So I just started my in-person lessons again. Um, so that's been fun, I missed having students. Um, but yeah, I really do think that even over the pandemic, the fans were supportive of um, you know, a couple of my bands like release records during the pandemic and people were supportive right. of, you know, buying them. Um, I occasionally would just post uh, a video of myself playing, which I never did pre-pandemic. Um, and, you know, I would post a minute of a stupid song that I learned and people were very supportive and gave me good feedback to keep doing it. So like, I felt like I got my fix of the fans even through the pandemic, just in different ways than getting their energy, like at a live show, so. Right. Yeah. Are, are you then, you know, kind of you alluded to it, uh, feeling that extra energy right now of, oh my gosh, it's back and I miss this click and the scene and, and I can't believe this is happening. Like, do you feel like it's elevated? Yeah, definitely. And yeah. I'm like appreciating it, the music, just like the experience of playing live music. I'm just, I feel like I'm appreciating it more now um, than I did before, so. Right. One positive to come out of like such a long break, you know. Right, because I think the worry for some folks, especially right away was maybe we would lose some musicians, you know, that are on that kind of edge of being able to sustain yourself and then the pandemic hits and it's like, you know what, this might be my sign that I, I can't do this. Yeah. Have you heard that story at all out there? Or do you feel like people are making it through? No, I, I feel like most of the people I know, you know, powered through it and they're, they're coming back and, you right. know, no one gave up. No one took that as a sign. 
it, most people I know, myself included, you know, took it as a sign that like, we really need this in our lives. You know? Right, yeah. yes. Yes, and so you're coming to town for Built to Last, which of course the theme for this show is, can you pass the test? <laughs> uh and and a celebration of jerry's birthday and i know that for instance you've played a bit with melvin who was you know in the jerry garcia band and you're you sort of have woven into this grateful dead sort of peripheral scene tell me a little bit about how that came about and and, and what that means to you well i mean grateful dead music in general um you know i grew up with it it was like one of the first bands that like I really connected with, um, you know, kind of as a teenager discovering music. Um, so just their music growing up just meant to me a lot as a fan. Um, and now being a musician, you know, it's really rewarding to like be able to play that music and continue, you know, their tradition, you know, just through the cover bands I play in and the, the people I get to play with that are sort of in the Grateful Dead family. You know, obviously playing with Melvin uh, is just like an otherworldly experience. Like he, I mean, he's directly connected to Jerry, which is really cool, but he's just an amazing player, a super cool human. And um, just the energy he brings on stage is really awesome. It's just like, he takes you to church is what we say. <laughs> right, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, and such a, I've had the luxury of interviewing him, and he played a past Built Built to Last Festival when his JGB offshoot came into town, and he's just such a sweet man, too. Her Terrapin Flyer, it, it, connect that in for me. Uh, so Terrapin Flyer, they're a Chicago-based Grateful Dead cover band. Um, there's, it's kind of headed up by one guy uh, named Doug Hagman and he's sort of the central band leader and over the years um, you know the lineup changes all the time um, you know from gig to gig or tour to tour and okay. um, just with different musicians and he'll often bring in um, people like Melvin or uh, you know we had Vince Wellnick on a couple tours right um, he often uses a guy named Scott Guberman who plays with you know, Phil. Um, and so just the lineup is constantly varying, which I really like. Because um, when I get to do the shows, when, when he calls me to play bass, it's always a different combination of musicians doing a different little spin on Grateful Dead, um, which just makes it really fun to play the, to play the music. You know, I can't help but ask when we talk about jumping in and out of bands like Terrapin Flyer, do, do you feel like you sort of heard almost every or played every dead song that would theoretically be picked into a set and is it too obscure and you can kind of pull them out? Do you have to brush up? Do you have to use an iPad? What's your process? I, you know, some Grateful Dead songs that I that I learned when I was younger, I just remember them. But now right. I have a problem, like I play in so many different bands I just have a problem like retaining all that information. So now I use an iPad and right. I have cards. And so if someone calls out a Grateful Dead song that I haven't played in two years, you know, I've got my notes. I can, I can make it through the song. Um, but I, I mean, I really like Terra Flyer because they, you know, they pull out deep cuts. You know, it's not just like shakedown. And, you know, they'll, mm. um, yeah, cool stuff. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry Band Years and Grateful Dead. Um, so yeah, I like, I like playing with them. And you're also working right now with Althea Grace, who has had a little bit of a splash on American Idol as well, if I'm connecting that dot correctly, right? That's the That's same correct. person, right? Yeah. Uh, tell me about that project. Uh, well, I first met Althea um, when she was just a kid, like she was maybe 10 or 11, and she would come to festivals with her parents, um, that family group company was playing. And that's where I first met her and then started seeing her get on stage with different bands sitting in. And she had a great voice. She was a great guitar player, even as a teenager. 
Um, and then I think it was about 2018 um, that we did our first show together, like as a band, you know, she had often just played as a solo artist, mm -hmm. um, played our first show as a band with a couple other guys from Chicago. And I just really enjoyed her original music. Um, and she's such, she's like wise beyond her years. She's just a great player, um, great singer. So it's cool to like see her, you know, excel and, you know, just get the notoriety she deserves. So it was, we just played this past weekend. It was the first time I'd seen her in a year and a half. So it was, it was cool. Right, and I uh, alluded to off the top that I saw a post of yours where you were talking about uh, the power going out in the middle of that gig. Yeah. And the, uh, and I, oh, I can't believe I'm doing it, but the grace that she had in that moment to make it work. Yeah, it was probably one of the coolest moments mm -hmm. that I've experienced on stage. Um, yeah, the power went out in the middle of the song. She didn't miss a beat. She just kept singing and getting the crowd clapping and singing along with her. And, you know, we could see the sound people like running around trying to fix it. And I don't know how long the power outage actually lasts. It felt like forever, but I think it was only like a minute or two. And the power came back on like right at the moment in the song where there's this big release. And so it was like, almost like we had planned it, you know? Uh, so it was so cool just to have a serendipitous moment like that. Yeah, that's awesome. And you have you had that happen before? I've had, yeah, the power goes out a lot, but usually we just stop because right. you know, we're, we're annoyed. <laughs> we want to, you know? Yes, yeah. yes, that looks amazing. And I want to talk about all of those, but I want to go in reverse. And so, Los Angeles. So you were talking about, you know, giving lessons, you know, I met you at a time when you were studying the bass at Music Institute in Hollywood. I, I don't know if I remember, how did you end up there? Uh, well, I went to um, undergrad in Pennsylvania. I got like a normal degree. But while I was in school, I was like, you know, I really want to study music. And so after I got my bachelor's, I, I went out to LA um because that was like the best you know music school for um like people that want to play like contemporary music not studying like a classical program at a university so this was a school that would prepare you for real world like rock um music to make it a career and so i just went for it you know i had been in pennsylvania almost my whole life and then went completely across the country uh to live in la it's kind of crazy <laughs> that is crazy I, I share that crazy with you having done the same thing um uh but so then did you meet the family group guys then you met them at school yeah we all met at school okay. uh, yeah probably about maybe a month after being there I saw a flyer on the bulletin board you know this was I mean there was internet back then but a flyer on a bulletin board was much more common than today <laughs> but it said, you know, bassist and drummer wanted for uh, original band. It listed the influences of like Fish, Modesky Martin Wood, and all these bands that I liked. And so met up those guys and they convinced me to move to Chicago after school, you know, after we were done with school to start like touring. Yeah, right on. Well, yeah. and obviously you played while you were in LA because we gigged with you guys. Yeah, yeah, we played a bunch out in LA, recorded our first record out there. Right. Um, but ultimately we decided that like touring from home base on one side of the country makes it hard to like get places. So Chicago was central to the country. So we were cool. able to like tour the Northeast for 10 days and then come home, tour the Southeast for two weeks and then come home, you know, do Colorado. We never quite made it like all the way back out to California. Um, but you know, we made it to Utah, it was the furthest west after moving to Chicago, but it worked out really well just for our our plan um, for tours. And yeah, we, I, I love Chicago, so I'm, I'm glad it, they brought me here. <laughs> yeah, that's that's wild. I, first, I thought that that was going back home for you. 
no. Uh, so you made that leap too. Yeah. LA, then Chicago. Yeah. Um, and I remember gigging with you guys down in San Diego at uh, Winston's in Ocean Beach, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Um, and you guys had a draw down there. Yeah, we that was a great mm. spot. I really liked um, just the vibe of that town. You know, LA had its its own vibe. Uh, but once we left LA, like Santa Barbara, San Diego, San Francisco, like really cool scenes. And the ones we were able to like return to on a regular basis, we were able to like build a little bit of a following. Um, so yeah, Winston's is one of those spots. Yeah, we appreciated the lift. Yeah. <laughs> Cause uh, I don't think we drew more than like, you know, the peripheral like 10 people that you know, dared come down from LA. Um, right. Another great spot that we we opened actually uh, in San Juan Capistrano at the Coach House there. Did you guys ever play the Coach House there? Familiar with that spot? It sounds familiar, but I'm not sure if we played there. Right. Yeah, it's kind of a cool spot in between San Diego and LA, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we got to open for the Mothers of Invention there one time, oh, Frank wow, Zappa's cool. band, which was crazy amazing. Uh, and then, do you remember drums and tuba? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We played with them there too. They right. were cool. That was a cool thing. Yeah, that was a unique project for sure. A, a fun thing about, like, I know you guys have deep roots at summer camp in, in um uh, Chicago. I know Family Groove is sort of the local jewel, if I will, of that. I, I said jewel <laughs> again. Can't have two jewels. The darling, the local darling of yeah. that fest. How many years now has it been? Uh, this will be, well, I guess we took off 2020 because the festival was postponed, but um, right. this year will be our 17th year playing it. Our first year was 2004. And this year is the festival's 20th anniversary. So we missed the first three but we've been on ever since. Um, and it's, it's just the best festival. It's great. Oh my gosh. What a, I, I mean, it, is that a, is there a record? Is there a record book that that's in? I think we are just one of a handful of bands that have done that. Right. Thing, so. Right. I think about like, I'm sure there's like, you know, the Mowdown or something like that, where or Kusikuka's Fest, where they've done it every year for, you know, 30 years. But uh, that's just so neat because those big fests like summer camp, you know, there's a lot of shuffle there and a lot of, you know, seasonal bands. So it's cool that you've been able to hang. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It like, yeah. like re-energizes us every year um, to kind of just keep playing and get to the next summer camp. <laughs> so. Right, totally. Yeah. It gives you another like sort of milestone thing. Yeah, that you don't want to give up. Um, that's so cool. And so, where what I was thinking there is, you have this amazing luxury of seeing so many other bands. What? Who do you dig? Who do you love being on co villain with, or you know? Oh wow. Um. So I really like. Now I'm thinking of like who I see it, who I get to see at summer camp. Um, Wood Brothers, one of my favorites. Mm. Um, lettuce, I really like like funk and lettuce is, you know, top of the funk game. <laughs> right. uh, Wolfpack, who mm. I've seen them live a couple times. They're so good. Um, who else? I don't know. Those are my, my top three I can think of right now. Those are biggies. Yeah, the, you know, the Wolfpack guys are pretty tied into our scene up here. Of course, Corey Wong is oh, yeah. t tight with everybody and gigs out of Minneapolis. And, you know, Theo's very tight with Reed and that and the old Shoeless guys. Um, and uh, but man, what a cool band and what a, a great vibe they have. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of other uh, notable musicians you played with and are linked to, I would throw Kimak in that group, right? Yeah. Tell, tell yeah. me about that experience. So it actually all started at a 10,000 Lakes Festival oh. back in, I think it was 2008. I played in an everyone orchestra. Mm. Uh, 
there, which for those that don't know what Everyone Orchestra is, um, it's they perform at a lot of festivals and they'll grab all these different musicians from different bands and put them on stage together. And there's one um, conductor by the name of B Matt Butler who sort of leads the whole thing and uh, involves the crowd. It's all Im improvisational. It's so fun to both play in and just watch as an audience member. It's really cool. Um, so he brought me in to play one of those and Steve Kimmack was on guitar. Mm. And uh, after the set, you know, he, he was talking to me, he's like, I really want you to play with my son, he's a drummer. And a few months later, he called me um, and brought me out to his house in Pennsylvania. And I jammed with him and his son, who was 19 at the time, John Morgan Kimmock and mm. Bernie Worrell on keys <laughs> so wow okay little old me be <laughs> like what is happening so we just had like an informal jam um in his barn where he had like a studio and then a few weeks later he asked me if I wanted to do some more shows and that's when they brought in I think Bernie was just sort of a stand-in because he lived nearby uh, but for this project, which was called Crazy Engine, he brought in um, Melvin Seals and Melvin's two um, singers that were in JGB at the time. So it was kind of a cool, like new Kimok thing with like vocals and Melvin and, you know, a, a younger rhythm section. So um, yeah, we did like an East Coast tour, West Coast tour. Uh, and it was, you know, my first time on a tour bus and like, um, just the music was amazing and I learned from so much from that experience it was so fun but what a neat thing Kimak in some circles a heralded guitar player and others I feel like a little bit underrated oh yeah definitely yeah you he, know but he's so good like his tone and his phrasing and yeah it's all just very smooth and like melodic like he's he's a fast player but he doesn't always like he's just very expressive and he doesn't showcase his chops like all the time like some guys that can play fast like he's very deliberate um really awesome player and just like funny guy so <laughs> that's awesome great so yeah you it, it felt comfortable to earn for that first bus experience that yeah that that's good yeah yeah we were a weird bunch like we were <laughs> just right. a random ages and backgrounds and but we all got along and it was really fun so. I love it um speaking of other players and bands that I know you uh gigged with and sat in with the big woo yeah <laughs> you've done that gig before right with not maybe right pre-pandemic Close to yeah, the pandemic was, in Chicago. Uh, yeah, so they were playing, they were booked in Chicago to play um, in like, it was in the winter, it was like January, February. I think this was 2019. Um, and I get a call from Mark in the afternoon and he's like, hey, are you free tonight? And I was like, what's up? <laughs> he, he said, well, our bass player's light like is canceled or something so Andy's flight was canceled it's like Can yeah you play with the big woo and I was like okay I'm free <laughs> like let's do it and he sent me uh I learned a bunch of their original songs in like a matter of a few hours <laughs> and um it was so fun yeah they're a great band great guys so I'm excited to uh just get back into the Minneapolis scene this weekend like I feel like I was much more tied into Minneapolis scene like a number of years ago uh, right. you know when like 10,000 Lakes was happening and um, cool. just when Family Groove was touring up there more regularly now we don't really go that far so I'm really excited to kind of link up with all my you know musician friends and fans that are from that area so yeah, I don't know why, and maybe it's not correct, but I feel like you are one of those folks that has for a long time had a presence here. And I mean, obviously I know you through kind of Mark Ryan from Down Low and who was in One Fluid Ounce, and obviously you two studied together. 
Um, you remember Ryan, right? Oh yeah. Ryan yeah. Nielsen, right. Um, and that whole click from MI. Um, and so did you see the Wu prior? Were you a Wu fan or it was, was it new? Um, I mean, I had heard of them. I think we had played many of the same festivals, but I didn't remember like seeing them live and it wasn't really familiar with their music, um, but I just knew right. they'd been around like longer than my band had. And they were, you know, big up in Minneapolis area. Um, so, but yeah, they're an awesome band. I love like learning their tunes, they're great songs. Yes, their song book is uh, so beautiful um, and songwriting in general. And they're in a Renaissance moment right now. The woo is back. Yeah. If they if they ever left, they, they, they're definitely back. So uh, it's neat to see them thrive and through all the iterations over the years. And you know, and that that I actually met Ryan that way. We were gigging in LA uh, on Santa Monica, I forget the name of the club, but there was this dude standing outside with a woo shirt on. And I walked oh, up wow. to him and was like, wait, how do you know that then? He's like, oh, well, I'm Ryan, and I, you know? <laughs> and then, and, and he's like, I looked online and saw that you were from back in the Midwest and you had this gig, so I came down. Oh. Um, and uh, so that's kind of how we linked up to uh, him. And, uh, and, you know, he's somewhat connect, you know, speaking of bridging back into the Built to Last show, I definitely want to talk about that because I couldn't be more excited for the lineup that's sort of emerged here. And I do know that at times a hired gun like yourself is kept in the dark on some of the details. <laughs> um, but us here in the Twin Cities are freaking out excited because of the rhythm section that has come together. I'm going to throw it out there, which will be, right? It will be Vinny from Mo, also with JT Bates. So double drummer with you on bass. I don't know if I'm breaking that news to you, but. Uh, I mean, I knew Al and Vinny from Mo were coming. Right. So, yeah. So you have Al and Vinny, you have JT Bates. Are you familiar with JT? No, I'm not. Yeah, he, he's recently done uh, this kind of obscure work with Taylor Swift. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, yeah. He's, he's a, uh, at least was and kind of is the drummer for Big Red Machine, which is Justin Vernon and Aaron from the Nationals uh, project. And then, of course, they helped Taylor and uh, with the last couple albums, the whole Evermore thing. And JT's got a, a, a number of drumming credits on there. He also uh, drummed on Mark's uh, Grundhofer, Mark, the Mark Joseph and the American Soul uh, EP that'll be coming out. JT is scorching hot right okay. now cool. and so cool. And his vibe is so perfect. And so to see you on bass and the multi-drummer scenario, uh, Eddie I met a mandolin from uh, White Iron, Mark Joseph on guitar. Uh, I know uh, Steph Devine singing backup. It's just a crazy, like, where do you get the woo? You from Family Groove and everything that you do. You have every, it's just a wild lineup. And then there's also, um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to think of his name, the mandolin player from Trampled by Turtles. And his group is also on that lineup. So nice. it's the it's the everyone orchestra, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, uh, and so uh, so, yeah, we're so excited to have you back in the cities and have you, you know, having you take part in what's going to be an extravaganza. Now, I will say, though, it's important to note that the personal six person igloos are sold out. OK, so noted. Just throw <laughs> that out there. Uh, but there definitely are tickets still available. There was a Build to Last Festival early in the season out at Blue Ribbon Pines, and now, now we have this iteration. How is that for you when you kind of need to cram in a situation like this and kind of flow into town and jump in? Uh, well, for something like this, where it's like music that I'm familiar with and that presumably everyone else in the band is familiar with, um, it's usually like a pretty easy, smooth, um, you know, experience. 
um, and can be really exciting because I mean, I'm, I'll play songs that I've played millions of times before, but it's with all different players that are new to me. So um, I'm really excited. I think it'll be really fun. Taking it now back to Family Group Company, which I look at you as that's kind of the main Janice project, like sort of your home base. Do you look at it that way or, or is that shifted for you? No, I mean, even though FGC has kind of slowed down our touring over the past few years, like I still consider that like my home project and that that's the music I like playing the most and the fans that I like seeing the most. Um, so I still, even though I probably play with them the least of, of most of my projects, um, like over the course of a year, I still right. consider FGC, like my OG, that's my jam. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like that uh, as well. And, you know, a, a, such, an, such a cool band, such a good crew of people involved too, you know, good people, good players tends to be what I've seen are those are, are the bands that last, yeah. you know, because you can deal with each other and make it through the ups and downs, <laughs> right. you know, um, because they're out there. Um, and you mentioned funk. I also think when I think of your playing, um, uh, I, I feel that. I think that also, if I'm going to be totally honest, is why the Twin Cities loves you. Uh, it, it is because you share that kind of funk influence energy about what you play. When I see you get super freaky on a cover, it's usually like a, a <laughs> funk cover uh, right. that you're doing. Uh, tell me about your interest and in love of funk. I don't, I don't really, I can't really place like where it started. Um, you know, none of my family is musical. So I didn't grow up in like a house where everyone was playing, but I started on piano at a young age. And I think, you know, I must have gotten some kind of like rhythmic stuff ingrained to me at that, at that age. I don't know where it came from, but as I got older, I really gravitated toward music that had like a groovy beat. Um, and in music school, I took a class that was all James Brown bass lines. And I loved how just the, the, the parts of the James Brown song, they like would all fit like perfectly like this, just, you know, whether you were playing a bass line that had two notes, it could still be funky as hell and just fit and like, you know, be perfect. And I've just became fascinated with like how rhythm section parts work together. And I think I brought a lot of that to FGC. Like we spent so much time like working out parts and making like cool decisions of how like a groove would be put together. Um, and that was like some of the funnest, you know, times of my life was just like writing and playing with FGC and kind of figuring out how to make like a super cool groove with, with the rhythm section. Where did you guys, where was your rehearsal space in LA? Uh, we just rehearsed it at Musicians Institute. Oh, you did? Yeah. Right on. Very cool. And that was that where a lot of that happened, that era? Uh, there and when we moved to Chicago, you know, we would rehearse a few times a week and just like work out um, tunes and parts. And, right. Um, so. I've seen over the years that you and Victor have... Um, cross paths a number of time and you've taken part in the base camp that's held here and there. Tell me about that. Uh, yeah, so Victor and I go back pretty far. Um, we played at a festival in <clears throat> Indiana. Geez, it must've been like 2006 um, that he helped produce. It was called Funk Fest, but the, the F-U-N-K stood for Friends of Nature and Knowledge. So it was kind of like a music festival, but also similar to his base camps where he had lots of like nature workshops. Um, oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, they it ran for maybe two or three years. It was a cool, cool festival. But um, Family Group Company was booked there. We're playing our set. And I see walk out in the crowd, Victor Wooten, walk out and sit down. 
<laughs> in the grass and like watch the rest of our set. And, you know, of course I'm terrified. There's this amazing bass player watching what I'm doing. And he came back um, backstage after the show and uh, said he really liked our band and asked if I would come sit in on a bass jam they were doing, um, you know, on another stage. So I got to play with him and Steve Bailey, uh, who's a great fretless player uh, mm. and some other bassists. And I um, can't remember if it was at that festival or later, but Victor nicknamed me the mistress of groove. And so that kind of became my <laughs> nickname. Wow, awesome. And we've gotten to play together a bunch over the years and he's a, he's a great guy and very supportive. Um, and yeah, just a, a big, influence and mentor for me so wow that's so neat that um you know he's connected with you in that way um and speaking of other sort of you know i didn't know what was it mistress of groove did you say yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay um i'm gonna i'm gonna remember that um uh, but uh, you I, I don't you sort of have this sort of folklore about you uh which is just such a cool thing and and your connection to him is definitely as a fan of you. I've always known that and seen that happen. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I love that. Uh, another thing is the the shirt, the, <laughs> the what would Janice do shirt. And I go right back. I, I feel like part of the catalyst is the picture of Fishman, the drummer from Fish, wearing the shirt. Yeah, right? that's right. <laughs> what is the story behind how that happened? Well, so the shirt started way back um at family groove shows like kids just started yelling out what would janice do and um we just uh one of our fans gave us the idea to make a t-shirt out of it and we did and now it's our best seller um i and so over the years just people that i end up playing with you know they see the shirt and they want the shirt and so in the case of fishman that was actually um I played with him in an everyone orchestra at a festival mm. down in Florida. And uh, after the show, you know, I had brought him a shirt. And after the show, I brought him a shirt. He loved it, put it on. And uh, we got the picture, which is legendary. That's <laughs> my best, what would you have picture? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we became sort of casual friends. And um, a few years later, Fish was playing in Chicago. And I, texted him I said hey if you have free time let me know I'll show you around and he sure enough called me and we went to dinner and meanwhile like 18 year old Janice is like freaking out because <laughs> I'm having dinner with John Fishman and during dinner his wife called and he's like oh do you mind if I get this and he picks up the phone he's like oh hi honey he's like yeah I'm at dinner with Janice and he goes yeah the one on the shirt <laughs> oh no Oh my gosh, that's yeah. awesome. It was awesome. So wow. Uh, yeah, that's how fish. Holy cow. Appeared. Yeah. That is so cool that he took you up on that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That yeah. that is legendary. Yeah. yeah. Who uh, who other notables like the big five in shirts? We've got him. I know there's a few others. Has Bernie uh, done the shirt? There's there's Victor Wooten. Right. Um, well, Steve Kim, of course. I mean, okay, right. <laughs> um, the keyboard player from String Cheese, Kyle. Okay. Hall, has right. One. Right. Um, you know, I can't remember. No, that's a, that's that's a good list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kyle was just down at Harmony Park for one of the summer in the park deals. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, with his side project. I think there was Nick, Nick David was on that, Bill and a couple others. Oh, nice. Uh, I, I would imagine you've been down to that hallowed ground once or twice or no? Uh, Park? Yeah, I think I've played, I played a Wookiee Foot Festival there. Mm -hmm. uh, does that sound familiar that they would put a sh festival on there? Oh, yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I played there a couple of times and blanking on what Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 They still do Shang, Shangri La. Uh, that's coming up here, uh, usually in end of the year fest, September. They used to do Project Earth there. 
Well, I'll tell you, Janice, how blessed are you? Man, I, now that I'm talking about it, I'm like, wow, this is cool. <laughs> like, I've been thinking about this all day. Like, how am I going to, and I feel like I'm all over the place because you have all of this stuff going on, but I am here to illuminate that for the people, including you, evidently, of how gosh darn cool you are. Oh, start. No. <laughs> <laughs> So amazing. And I got to introduce Family Group Company one time at a show, which is another one of my duties that I'll do on the first when you're in town for Built to Last is uh, I'm allowed to be the obscure, slightly out of control older guy <laughs> on the mic. Um, oh. Yep. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I recently did uh, a hosting night where I called the band the completely wrong name when I introduced oh. them. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, so that was horrible, but awesome because they were cool about it. Um, but I introduced you guys at a festival way up in like Eagle something, Wisconsin one time um, that I think was one of the last Farmapaloozas, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And I was emceeing there um, and it was at like this campground deal and uh, I don't know if you remember that one. But. I mean, I remember playing Farmapalooza, like just being impressed with like the production and the stage and everything. Cause we, you know, we had played a bunch of small festivals and you get there and it's like a dumpy stage and bad sound. But right. I remember Farmapalooza being like, oh, this is pretty legit. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, Farmapalooza was great at losing money. <laughs> <laughs> you know like it was a true musicians festival right where the backstage was way overdone and the food was we used to do cheese sculptures with people's band names in them <laughs> like uh my mom hooked that up from her work like oh, wow. there, was, there was a keller williams bootleg i used to have where he sang about my mom giving him a cheese sculpture <laughs> and i like crazy in the audience, like looking around everyone, like, wait, this is happening, but no one gets it, but we <laughs> right. get it. maybe this story will come up again. Now it's 25 years later and here we are. Right. Um, can we say hi to uh, Bootsy back there? Yeah. It's Bootsy, right? Bootsy. Bootsy. She went to nap in the other room. She got bored with this room. Let me get her. <laughs> Bootsy. Hi. Oh, Hi. There, here we go. there you are, precious. Hi. <laughs> oh, you've been so good. Yeah, she's a good girl. She naps most of the day and then bugs me. What? <laughs> she's, I, I get kind of like a Lou Dog, sublime Lou Dog vibe from Bootsy. Oh, uh, yeah. I can see right? That. Yeah. Like, is Bootsy laid on some stages during your gigs? Is that the, what's going on here or in uh, the band? Or? Sometimes, it, usually the bands I play in are pretty loud, but she's right. been on stage for like an acoustic -y type gig. Right. Uh, she likes to come and hang out backstage and get pets from people. Usually the most asked question I get these days is where's Bootsy? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. I'm speaking for everybody in our little sort of uh somewhat tightly knit grateful dead community jam community that we love you janice thank you for continuing with your art thank you for blessing us with you know with music and being such an integral part of that it obviously helps us survive and we're gonna bring you under our soft feathered Aww. wing <laughs> this weekend and uh, well, I'm just really honored to be a part of it. I know you said you guys are, you know, you showered me with all these compliments, but really it's like, I'm, it's my pleasure, my honor to be invited to this cool experience. And I'm just really ex excited to like link up back up with the, the Twin Cities fam. You know, it's been so long, so. Right on. Well, thanks again. Appreciate you and have an amazing, amazing night and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Turner. Check up on the check-in by checking out YouTube. Like and subscribe.